Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today at the Institute for Safe Medication Practices for a webinar program entitled High Alert Medications, Heparin, Concentrated Electrolytes and Magnesium, Practical Strategies in Pursuit of Safety. My name is Susan Paparella. I'm a registered nurse and vice president at ISMP. I will be your host and one of the speakers for today's program. While most medications in healthcare today have a wide margin of safety, there remain some which can cause serious harm or death if they are misused. To reduce the risk of error with these high alert medications, special precautions and high leverage strategies should be employed to avoid serious patient safety events. Numerous organizations have told us that they've taken steps to identify these high alert medications but many report they are less than confident that they have taken all of the necessary precautions against serious patient harm when using these medications. This webinar today is the second of the two programs on high alert medications. You have, made, have joined us back in December of last year when the program focused on insulin and vasopressors. Today, the faculty will focus particular attention on the risks identified with three other high alert drugs and drug classes, including heparin, concentrated electrolytes and magnesium, and will shine light on current practices from the results of the ISMP medication safety self-assessment for high alert medications. We would like to thank Baxter for their generous support for this series of programming and what you're about to listen to today. Next slide, please. We are fortunate to have a variety of continuing education credits available for today's program. Starting with pharmacists and technicians, today's program is accredited for 1.25 ACPE contact hours through GROCE on completion of the post-program evaluation by all of our program attendees uh, due by February 25th, so that's one month. Next slide, please. When the webinar is over and as you close the program, you will automatically be taken to the ISMP website page for this webinar and on the right-hand side of the page, you will see available links to claim your CE. An attendance code will be provided at the end of the presentation today that you will need to enter. Next slide, please. Additionally, this program is being approved for 1.25 nursing contact hours by the Pennsylvania Board, of, or excuse me, by the California Board of Registered Nursing, and also been approved for one contact hour of continuing education credit for its fulfillment of ASHRAM's requirements for the CPHRM Content Outline Category 1 Clinical Patient Safety. Next slide, please. Uh, our speakers for today's program have nothing to disclose. And just some quick housekeeping items. This program is being recorded and will be available on the ISMP website. Handouts for today's program can be found using the link provided in the reminder email you received earlier today, as well as in the Zoom chat box. All attendees are in listen mode only during the presentation, but feel free to ask a question by accessing the Q&A or chat functionality on your toolbar. If the speaker doesn't address the question during the program, uh, we're hoping to have some time at the end for some questions and answers. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, you're there already. Thank you, Jordan. Learning objectives. By the end of today's program, the participants should be able to define high alert medications and their impact on patient safety, describe the low scoring items for heparin, concentrated electrolytes, and magnesium from the ISMP medication safety self-assessment for high alert medications, and cite at least two effective strategies for each uh, for harm prevention for these three products. So in an essence of time, we're going to make our uh, introductions to our faculty very brief today. Next slide, please. Uh, first up is uh, Christina Mahalik. Christina is a pharmacist and a medication safety specialist and our administrative coordinator for the Medication Safety Officer Society at ISMP. I will be your second speaker for today. Again, Susan Paparella, registered nurse and vice president of ISMP. And Michelle Mandrap, who is our third speaker today, is a registered nurse and is the director of consulting at ISMP. Complete bios for today's speakers are available on the program webpage and also on the ISMP website. So, without further delay, uh, welcome, Christina, and can you please go ahead? Well, thanks so much, Sue, for that great introduction. Let's have our next slide, Jordan. 
when we ask practitioners about what high alert medications mean to them, we hear a variety of interpretations. Sometimes people will tell us that high alert medications include hazardous drugs. Sometimes people will believe that high alert medications are those drugs that are involved in a high percentage of errors. Sometimes people will tell us that high alert medications include those drugs that carry a high risk of abuse. And at other times, some people will tell us that all sound alike and look alike drugs are also high alert medications. But the intention and the call out for these particular medications was really meant to identify those drugs that bear a heightened risk of causing significant patient harm when they're used in error. Uh, the mistakes may or may not be more common with these drugs, but the consequences of those errors will be more devastating to patients. And that's what differentiates these group of medications from other drugs. Um, they could include hazardous drugs, they could include medications that have high risk of abuse, and they might also include sound alike and look alike medications, but those were not the original targets for this list. We actually introduced the first list of high alert medications in the 1990s. And you see on the right hand side of this slide, these are our three current high alert medication list. The acute care list was introduced in the 90s and we periodically updated all of the lists. Um, to update them, we look through our National Medication Errors Reporting Program data. We also search literature reports. We talk to practitioners. Some of you listening might have even participated in our surveys related to the high alert medication lists as we've updated them. And then finally, we consult with other safety experts. But in addition to the acute care setting high alert medication list, we also have a list that's specific to the community setting, the ambulatory care setting. That was introduced in 2008 um, and it was updated last year. And then our newest list is one that represents medications that bear that heightened risk of causing harm when used in error in the long-term care setting. And we introduced that list in 2016. Next slide, please. For those of you that are history buffs or like to hear about history, this is really where it all started. This is the front page of an article that was written by ISMP's President Emeritus, Mike Cohen, and another one of his colleagues, Neil Davis, both of them pharmacists from Temple University um, in Philadelphia. That's where they were when this was written. And, you know, look at that headline. It's super attention grabbing, certainly something that would stop me in my tracks and make me read it. Today's poisons, how to keep them from killing your patients. And the call out there on the right-hand side, you see, um, and the skull and crossbones, again, really scary, something to definitely make you stop and, and pay attention. Um, the, the call out says, some drugs surface all too often in avoidable cases of deadly error. Consider lidocaine, vincristine, sodium chloride, insulin, potassium chloride, and morphine. Every one of those drugs still exists on our high alert medication list today. This was published in 1989 in the journal Nursing 89. You might be familiar with that journal, the Nursing Journal. It's actually a peer reviewed journal. It began in 1971 and they publish each year changing the year. So there's a Nursing 2022 out there now. So the original premise for high alert medications really started here with this article. Next slide, please. Every two years, ISMP updates its targeted medication safety best practices for hospitals. And last year in 2021, when we met with our expert advisory panel to discuss current safety challenges and 
you know, how we might consider changing our best practices, the subject of high alert medications was brought up. And several members of that panel felt we really could do better safeguarding ourselves against error with these drugs. Um, for that reason, we decided to introduce a new best practice related to high alert medications. So what this best practice says um, is for each medication on the facility's high alert medication list, outline a robust set of processes for managing risk, impacting as many steps of the medication use process as feasible. Next slide, please. And we got a little specific. We have five sub statements that we'd like people to target with high alert medications. And the first one is to ensure that the strategies that address system vulnerabilities occur in each stage of the medication use process. You know, not just focusing on administration, not just focusing on uh, dispensing. And also that those strategies ap apply to multiple practitioner types, not just nurses or pharmacists, but also prescribers and other practitioners involved with medication use. We're also calling for individuals to avoid reliance on lower level leverage risk reduction strategies and really instead try and bundle those with mid and higher level strategies. Also, one of the things that we find quite a bit is that practitioners will implement independent double checks for all medications, in some cases, on their high alert medication list. And we really believe that that strategy, which is a mid-level strategy, should be um, used selectively for select high alert medications. Also, that we want all organizations to regularly assess their risk by looking at their own internal data as well as data from other sources. And then finally, as with any good uh, process improvement plan, measure your success. Measure, put in process measures to monitor safety and routinely collect that data to determine how effective your risk reduction strategies are. Next slide, please. In 2018, as Sue introduced, um, ISMP developed the medication safety self-assessment for high alert medications. This was funded and supported by the US Food and Drug Administration. Next slide. And the goals of this self-assessment were to ass assist providers to assess the safety of systems and practices associated with 11 different categories of high alert medications. And as Sue said, we're going to talk about three of those today with you, magnesium sulfate, concentrated electrolytes, and the anticoagulant heparin. Next slide. In that self-assessment, there were 380 critical safe medication systems and practice items. And those items were selected by ISMP staff along with an advisory group. And it was based on the types of errors and safety risks that were identified in the settings in which these drugs were used. The assessment items are a combination of evidence-based items and consensus-based expert opinions. And the goal of putting together these items in the self-assessment was really to even push beyond the minimum standards of practice. Next slide, please. In the scoring of the items in the self-assessment, each item was given a weighted score. And those items that really pushed the strategies towards looking at affecting system reliability and not focusing on individual or human reliability were weighted heavier. So if you had a forcing function, if you were able to implement something that would be a hard stop, that item was weighted heavier than if you were providing somebody a reminder. Next slide. 
there were five categories for scoring. And this is very similar with all of our medication safety self-assessments. But for the purpose of discussion, we typically bucket these into three different buckets. So our none bucket are those practitioners who took the self-assessment and responded that they have either done no activity towards implementing that item, or they might have discussed it, but they just haven't implemented it yet. In the middle, we have the partial bucket. These are practitioners who looked at that self-assessment item. They assess that they've either, they've partially implemented it either for some or all patients, some or all orders, drugs, or staff, depending on, on who it applied to. Or maybe they have it fully implemented, but not for every patient, every order, every drug, or every staff member for which it would apply. So that's our partial bucket. And then finally, the full bucket, those practitioners who looked at that item and their multidisciplinary group team members assess that we fully implemented this for every patient order drug staff member that would qualify in this setting. So next slide. I'm gonna take a deeper dive into heparin now and look at some of the strategies to more safely use heparin. Next slide, please. Uh, when you think about unfractionated heparin, when we're using it for treatment, um, the potential for injury can be high if we um, have errors, if we have uh, a subtherapeutic level for therapeutic concentration in patients, we can risk having an embolism, we can risk uh, an existing thrombus uh, getting larger. Um, if we over uh, shoot, if we have a super therapeutic serum concentration and overshoot, we can risk bleeding in patients. Definitely standardization here is key. Um, most of these are protocol-based ordering. There's a lot of steps to these protocols. Achieving that ideal state takes a, a lot of effort. We're trying to coordinate uh, serum concentrations with dosing and dose changes. Um, so really maintaining therapeutic levels is important, but to get there, there's a lot of steps in the process. Next, please. In the section of the self-assessment that was directed towards anticoagulants, there were 43 different self-assessment items. And these items, some of them were just general items, some are targeted to unfractionated heparin or targeted to low molecular weight heparin, some focused on direct oral anticoagulants and others focused on warfarin. There were 564 different facilities that submitted for this section. And, and just as a reminder, with this assessment, you could pick and choose which um, part of the assessment you wanted to do. You did not have to do the full assessment in order to submit your scores. So there were 564 facilities who submitted for the anticoagulant section. Next slide. What I'd like to do is share those items that had the lowest score. You know, and these are those areas where we have the highest risk exposure. So this is one of the lower scoring items. And I, again, I'm trying to help you focus on heparin, although some of these will apply to other anticoagulants. This particular item states that when orders for antithrombotic agents are entered, the computer system alerts practitioners if the patients received an antithrombotic, even if it was a one-time dose, within the prior 24 hours. And we've added a qualifier here too. We want to make sure that the computer system is alerting us if the patient has received that in any department in the organization. So that could be the emergency department or the cardiac catheterization laboratory or interventional radiology. And this is to ensure that adequate time has elapsed between the doses of the same or different antithrombotic agents. So this is really getting a concomitant therapy. And if you move to the right side of this slide, moving right to left, you see 28% of those organizations who responded to this self-assessment item said that they fully implemented it. So that's less than a third. 
Um, about a third said they haven't partially implemented it. 40% said they, they haven't done anything with relationship to this. And then we have the mean. And each one of the slides will be set up in this manner so that you can see the statistics. Next slide, please. These two items look at contraindications for use and also the transitions of care. So the first item, uh, protocols and order sets identify the specific drugs, interventions, and treatments that should be avoided in patients receiving anticoagulants. And you know, looking at those people that really have addressed this risk, 34% of them have fully addressed that risk. Um, a 40% partially, so there's, they're working on it, and about a quarter have not addressed it at all. The second item states that protocols or guidelines exist to facilitate that transition between different anticoagulants. 38% have fully been able to address that risk, uh, 32 partial, 30% none at all. So let me share with you, next slide please, uh, a, a case example where um, the risk was there and there was really a lack of appropriate warning for concomitant therapy. Um, in this case, this was a, an 86 year old woman who was hospitalized. The woman had a history of atrial fibrillation and had been prescribed anoxaparin, um, 60 milligrams twice a day or Q12 hours. Uh, the next day warfarin was actually added to the drug regimen. And then later in the week, a gastroenterologist had recommended a colonoscopy for the patient. So the warfarin was discontinued and heparin was ordered. However, nothing was done to the anoxaparin. And it wasn't until a day later when the patient's hemoglobin and hematocrit had dropped then at, that they realized that both drugs were still active and the patient was receiving both. And at that point, the patient actually had evidence of internal bleeding, unfortunately. Next slide, please. These three items speak to decision support, you know, helping practitioners to make informed decisions about the care of patients. The first item looks at um, the most recent laboratory value and whether that is automatically displayed on the order entry system screen where practitioners place or verify orders for anticoagulants, certainly trying to alert them or show them what that value is and help them make an informed decision. 47% of those that responded said that they have this fully covered um, in their systems. 21% said that they have it partially addressed and 32% haven't done anything with that at all. And a lot of times the barriers here are the electronic health record and people's ability to be able to activate some of this decision support. The second item, a standard reliable process is in place for screening patients who are receiving anticoagulations before invasive procedures. Um, whether that therapy has to be discontinued, what protocol and guidelines then define when they should be stopped and when they should be restarted. Um, this sort of gets a little bit more complicated and, and also introduces some of those risks when we have those handoffs in care. And 38% of the respondents have fully been able to implement that self-assessment item. And finally, uh, prior to ordering unfractionated heparin or using a heparin-coated catheter or, in, or instrument, there's a history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or allergy to heparin determined and documented so that the system is able to actually provide an alert to practitioners. And 57% of the organizations who responded to that said that they have that fully implemented. Next slide. And these two items are related. These address that heparin um, induced thrombocytopenia. And the first one, so we, we're talking about a patient here who has HIT suspected or diagnosed during their current therapy. And 
this first item is looking for a mechanism to ensure that all sources of unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin are discontinued in this situation where HIT is suspected or diagnosed. And 66% of the respondents said that they fully implemented that. The second item in the same scenario is looking for a prominent entry placed into the patient's medical record to alert staff to avoid the administration of her exposure to heparin in, in any form, including those for used for arterial lines or catheter flushes or those heparin coated instruments or catheters. And 63% said that they have that fully implemented. Next slide. So I, I would like to share a case example related to that as well. Um, in this case, a patient presented to an emergency department with a cardiac emergency, and they were started on an oxaparin. Um, they were subsequently transferred to a different facility for a cardiac catheterization. And at that facility, the anoxaparin was stopped and they were started on heparin. It wasn't until the provider noticed that there was a significant drop in the patient's platelet count that the patient actually had a history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, so they were two different organizations, neither of which were able to achieve that self-assessment item that I just discussed with you to alert these practitioners to that, that history and that risk. So um, I shared with you the self-assessment responses that got the lowest scoring um, responses in terms of full implementation. But we also know that unfractionated heparin carries risks based on event reports. And these are some of the categories of that, those risks. So we have seen bolus doses or adjusted rates not in alignment with protocols when using heparin infusion therapy. We've seen doses calculated using an incorrect or an inaccurate weight. It could be a stated weight. It could be an estimated weight. We've seen the wrong protocol followed. We've seen events where the heparin is restarted at the wrong time. We've seen providers from the very beginning part of the process, order the wrong protocol on the patients. And then we've seen variations in interpretation and misinterpretation of protocols. It could be related to the draw time for labs. It could be related to when to start or restart therapy. Um, and it's also been related to what dose to select when restarting therapy. Next. And um, before I finish, I would also like to share where we're doing good. Um, these items were the highest scoring items in the anticoagulation section of the self-assessment, just particularly related to unfractionated heparin. And if you scan through these items, you'll see that we are doing good when it comes to stock, limiting the concentration of unfractionated heparin vials or um, making sure that when we're using heparin flush that it's a commercially prepared flush syringe. We're also good at standardizing concentrations, standardizing concentrations for neonates, for pediatric patients and adult patients. And we're also doing good in using pre-mixed solutions of heparin infusion. Next. If um, anticoagulation or improving components to anticoagulation as an area of performance improvement for you. Um, we also have a second resource. This is a self-assessment that we've done prior to the high alert self-assessment, and it's particular to antithrombotic therapy. And if you want to dive in deeper, maybe you've done the self-assessment already the high alert self-assessment. Uh, maybe you're in the process of looking at that and you wanna take a deeper dive. This self-assessment has even more statements related to practices to avoid harm with antithrombotic agents. So with that, I'm gonna call Sue in to take over. Great, thank you, Christina. That was, that was great. I really appreciate uh, you giving us that overview. So I'm gonna continue now to talk about concentrated electrolytes. 
And as you know, electrolytes are essential chemicals needed to regulate nerve and muscle function, to hydrate the body, balance both acidity and blood pressure, and are known to help rebuild damaged tissue. So clinical care often involves the necessary electrolyte replacement in order to restore health. Replacement can often involve the use of concentrated electrolyte solutions. Uh, but what are these? So according to the Joint Commission, concentrated electrolytes are described as solutions that are manufactured and distributed with the intent of being diluted prior to administration. So we're not talking about those pre-diluted solutions, but those vials that must be diluted prior to administration. When we talk about concentrated electrolytes, many practitioners immediately think of potassium chloride concentrate. However, as you know, there are many other electrolytes that fit this bill, including 3% hypertonic saline solution, 23.4% sodium chloride solution, sodium bicarbonate 8.4%, sodium and potassium phosphates, and magnesium sulfate, which Michelle will talk about in just a few minutes. Concentrated electrolytes have been included in the high alert list from the very beginning, primarily because they are not, if they're not administered properly, either not properly diluted, misselected, or confused with other drugs, it can be almost clinically impossible to swiftly reverse the effects of that concentrated uh, bolus of solution and thus death and serious injury and disability may result. Next slide. So in the ISMP medication safety self-assessment for high alerts, there was a section entitled concentrated electrolyte injections. And in this section, there were 26 items representing the best practices to manage these products. And as you can see here, these 26 items were divided uh, into nine items that considered the general electrolyte replacement therapy questions. And then there were items such as four related specifically to potassium chloride, seven for hypertonic sodium chloride greater than 0.9%, uh, three items for phosphates, both potassium and sodium, two items on electrolytes used with parental nutrition, and one item for organ preservation solutions. In this section, 544 facilities submitted results, and I'd like to share the highlights of these practices um, throughout the segment with you. Next slide. So this represents some of the lowest scoring general items in the concentrated electrolyte section of the assessment. And if you can look here at the first one, when we wanted to look at the number of organizations that had a system in place to proactively convert IV to oral electrolyte replacement therapy, you can see here that greater than 50% of participants reported that they had not taken any steps uh, to ensure that they had either a pharmacy managed or automated system in place to do this um, transition. Only 22% stated that they had fully implemented such a process. Less than a third of organizations reported that they had fully implemented any standard order sets to prescribe adult pediatric or neonatal electrolyte replacement therapy, and that these order sets included required patient monitoring. Only about 50% of organizations reported partial adoption of this practice. The next two items on this chart here represent lower scoring items in responses to a best practice item question about the existence of uh, items or elements within standard protocols for concentrated electrolytes. So for example, looking at how many times the protocols uh, mention patient monitoring being required as part of that IV administration replacement therapy. And only about 37% of organizations that reported uh, told us that they had that included in their, um, in their protocols. Uh, this would include routine monitoring, such as continuous ECG monitoring, frequency of patient assessment, uh, serum electrolyte levels, and other laboratory monitoring as appropriate. And lastly, um, another element that we looked at um, within the same standard protocol section, 2A, was looking at maximum concentration and infusion rates for IV solutions, as well as concentration requirements for central line use. So we had 43% of participants that did not have any of this as part of the requirements or only partially implemented the safety practice. Um, certainly believing, um, leading us to believe that there's an opportunity to improve the safety of these electrolyte replacement protocols. Next slide, please, Jordan. 
So let's spend a few minutes now um, talking specifically about um, some concentrated electrolytes, uh, the first being uh, concentrated potassium chloride. Next slide. So as you know, ISMP has been long concerned about the handling and use of concentrated potassium chloride. Some of the work goes back as far as 1987, where we were involved in a national meeting with the USP and the US Food and Drug Administration, uh, trying to make sure that we could call out um, the differences that need to occur so that these vials were not mixed up in practice. And uh, that resulted in these potassium chloride concentrate injections having black caps, and uh, specific warning statements, again, to uh, prevent this mix up with other parenteral drugs. But as you may recall, if you've been in practice for a while, that although some of these changes occurred, potassium chloride vials at that time remained on the nursing units and continued to be involved in fatalities. Um, in the 80s and 90s, ISMP, USP, the Joint Commission, and IHI uh, worked very hard to draw attention to this, uh, what we thought was um, a, a challenge. We uh, sent a bold, uh, sent a, a um, letter out, a nationwide mailing to US hospitals strongly recommending the removal of potassium chloride from patient care areas. And with some um, help with some of the, um, the medication safety alerts that came out and the first sentinel advisory in 1998 from the Joint Commission, uh, we were able to um, uh, pivot and uh, really make that change a reality. Uh, as you know, uh, keeping those concentrated electrolytes off the clinical units uh, was expanded in one of the first national patient safety goals for the Joint Commission and continues to this day to be addressed in medication management standard MM.03.01.01 .01 .01 element of performance nine. Uh, this change in expectations about limiting access and the uh, adoption of commercially available pre-mixed potassium replacement fluids has had a significant impact on the preventable deaths from concentrated potassium chloride vials. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, before we um, tell our, our success too much, we have to really recognize that we're still vulnerable. Um, to these types of errors. Uh, in June of this past year, we reported on how easy it was for this risk um, to still uh, reappear. Uh, we had a report of a patient in the ICU who experienced a cardiac arrest uh, because this patient had a contagious infectious disease, not COVID-19, um, but because of the potential for staff exposure, there was a limited uh, code response of just a few individuals, but included an, an experienced intensivist, an experienced ICU pharmacist, a nurse fellow in training, and their preceptor. And uh, during the code, the ICU intensivist requested uh, potassium chloride 20 mil equivalents IV. Uh, the pharmacist was in the role of pulling and preparing the medications and uh, assumed that the intensivist did not want to administer um, the potassium via infusion knowing that it would take you know, an hour to administer and they were you know, in the heat of this resuscitation. So instead the pharmacist um, you know, thought that maybe somehow the intensivist had purposely ordered this drug to be administered undiluted, uh, knowing that it could stop the heart, but it was a new and unique treatment somehow intended to save the patient during the code. Uh, so uh, the pharmacist called the central pharmacy, requested a vial because it wasn't available on the crash card as a safety precaution. It was delivered to the patient room. Um, he, the pharmacist, as he was preparing it, said to the intensivist, do you still want to give the potassium chloride 20 mil equivalents IV? Um, and the intensivist said yes. They handed the syringe off to the nurse fellow, who was again uh, there with their preceptor, and this uh, potassium chloride did get um, pushed and unfortunately um, uh, resulted in the patient's death. And we know um, now that there is a variety of root causes, you know, behind this particular event, um, but particularly striking was uh, somehow that the expectation had not been established to prohibit the dispensing of the concentrated potassium chloride vials outside of the pharmacy without question. And I know that that sounds um, maybe like you can't believe that would happen, uh, but I think um, very clearly, since some of these practices have existed for a long time, uh, as, as new practitioners come on, it is really up to us to make sure that we 
um, explain some of the decisions, whether it's storage decisions or dispensing decisions that we have to make sure that everybody understands um, the, the history of why we have made those decisions and what the resulting um, outcomes to be. So next slide, please. So let's take a look at those high alert assessment, uh, low scoring items for potassium. Um, there's three here that I just wanna call out. Uh, first for maintenance infusions uh, for potassium, only manufactured pre-mixed potassium chloride solutions are used. Um, and as you can see here, we don't have as high as um, adoption of this best practice as we would like. Um, you know, together the partials and pools make up you know, over 85%, but yet there is still an opportunity to commit to the use of those commercially available products. And the same you can see for single and intermittent infusions in our second item, uh, when that repl IV replacement is used for hypokalemia, we want to see manufactured pre-mixed potassium chloride solutions that are marked as highly concentrated. Um, and we want to make sure they're used as much as possible. And in this case, 61% of organizations, more than the, um, the large um, um, maintenance infusions, um, are fully implemented in this case. And the last one, item 15, looks at the management of concentrated potassium vials when used outside the pharmacy. Most often this involves the use of these vials for cardioplegia, such as an, an open heart case. Um, ideally, we would recommend, even before sending vials, the use of a commercially available or pharmacy manufactured solution for cardioplegia. But um, if they do need to be sent uh, to the unit, that these vials are sequestered in sealed kits and only removed immediately before use. And we can see here that 76%, pretty high, have now implemented uh, this practice. Um, and not as part of this question, but certainly as a best practice scenario, there should be a process in place if you are sending these vials to the OR, for example, in these kits, to make sure that those vials, once the case or procedure is over, that these vials are secured, accounted for, and any unused vials are returned uh, immediately to the pharmacy for reconciliation so that we don't have to worry that any of them remained uh, behind in the OR or in the procedure area or the backup cart. Next item, please. Uh, so in summary for injectable um, potassium chloride recommendations, you know, you understood most of these already. We're limiting access to these products, um, storage and pharmacy only, sequestering them as much as possible. And you take the time to ask your staff, um, give them a scenario to see if during an emergency or a code, anyone uh, might um, decide that there could be opportunity to dispense a vial outside the pharmacy. It might uh, surprise us to see if that possibly could still happen. Uh, we want to make sure we limit compounding, uh, use pre-diluted standardized solutions as much as possible, avoiding those custom compounds that cannot be purchased. We want to enhance the use of automation and workflow system for compounded electrolytes and potassium chloride and prepare those in the pharmacy um, as much as possible so you can acquire those redundancies of those critical um, checks along the way. We want to make sure that, again, even in pharmacy, we're sequestering and storage and making sure that if we're avoiding any possible storage in open ADCs, matrix drawers, or towers. And if you do have to uh, distribute outside the pharmacy, make sure that you're using some proactive thinking, some failure mode and effects analysis to really identify and uh, acknowledge if there's any risk that exists. Next slide, please. Right, we're going to go on to concentrated sodium chloride. As we know, the sodium chloride solutions are not all created equal. 0.9% is considered isotonic with body fluids and safe to administer IV, whereas hypertonic saline, anything greater than 0.9%, such as 3% sodium chloride or 23.4% is hypertonic, and when large enough volume is injected, can cause serious patient harm. The slide here is showing us some uh, error examples we've gotten into ISAP uh, because of the misuse of the hypertonic saline. Uh, we had an event where an IV technician accidentally stocked the hypertonic saline in the ABC instead of 500 mLs of sodium chloride. The error was fortunately caught by another technician and the bags were retrieved. But what was, what was concerning particularly to this organization was this error had happened twice um, within three months. 
And they recognized that um, these products looked alike and there was some um, uh, refill processes with the ADC that did not include some barcode scanning. And uh, they wanted to make sure that uh, everyone knew about the risk associated with the way that this process worked. Um, so they had some um, work to do to um, try to resolve that. In another event, a drug shortage of 3% solution resulted in a pharmacy um, preparation, um, what they described as on the fly, using an automated compounder. And although they did do their due diligence, the formula was checked, it was checked by a manager, it was checked by an informatics pharmacist as well, a mathematical error resulted in a 6% product that was labeled as a 3%. And the sodium content on a 250 ml uh, container is listed as per liter, not as per 250 ml. So the pharmacist mistakenly set up the proportion per liter, adding too much sodium to the 500 ml bag. Several bags were dispensed in this case and several patients unfortunately were exposed to the error before it was discovered. And then we're also aware of errors with sodium chloride solutions during the programming of smart pumps because um, in particular, the pediatric hypertonic sodium chloride prescribing information many times is dosed as milliliters per kilogram or milliliters per kilogram per hour. But the smart infusion pump libraries commonly weight list the solution in milliequivalents per kilogram uh, bolus dose or milliequivalents per kilogram per hour for the infusion. Next slide. So safe management of concentrated sodium chloride is sometimes complicated by the need to use hypertonic sodium chloride to emergently reduce intracranial pressure or cerebral edema in adults and pediatric patients after neurological injury. Um, and this hypertonic saline has really become the standard in care um, instead of mannitol in some of these conditions. So once that hypertonic sodium chloride um, is administered, it decreases intracranial pressure, sometimes in minutes, um, and can have lasting effects up to 24 hours. In the past, ISMP has made repeated safe practice recommendations, for example, in our ADC guidelines, and I know in this self-assessment tool, to restrict the hypertonic sodium chloride, 23.4% vials to the pharmacy, and to really restrict the distribution of the 3% saline. However, during a recent Medication Safety Officer Society call, we heard um, loud and clear from some organizations that were struggling just because of the clinical delays in treatment when they're waiting for pharmacy to prepare and dispense these doses and infusions of hypertonic saline. And so while we still believe um, it is important to limit the hypertonic sodium chloride storage in clinical units, certainly when unnecessary and as much as possible, uh, we also believe that robust risk assessments uh, should be done when making decisions about storage in these specialty areas when treating patients. So there might be other alternatives if they have to send uh, a vial, having it in a limited quantity, uh, locking it in a lidded compartment in the ADC, having limited access, not allowing it to be pulled on override by all providers, um, having indication-based standard order sets that limit the dosing, and making sure that the smart pump libraries um, match um, the, the dosing units. Um, so whenever possible, we still think it's important to have pharmacy dispense the syringes of 23.4% sodium chloride, uh, ideally hand deliver it the dose, the patient specific dose to the healthcare provider who's administered this drug. Um, but we recognize if you're one of these facilities um, that have these emergencies and it's a life threatening situation um, that you may um, adopt a different level of access to some of these products. And for that, we would encourage you to see the full list of recommendations from ISMP uh, for the emergency management of hypertonic saline in our November 2021 issue that's um, available on our website, and you can see that here. Next slide, please. So here's uh, some of our findings from the self-assessment on hypertonic saline. More than a third of the organizations, 43%, uh, in fact, did not have any type of protocols or order sets um, that were indication-based for the monitoring and the use of hypertonic saline. And only about a third of organizations really indicated that they had fully implemented um, policies to ensure these best practices. IV push doses of 23.4% sodium chloride are prepared in the pharmacy labeled and hand delivered 
to urgent and critical care administrating providers. Um, when we looked at that item in particular, more than half or 55% um, are, are doing that fully. Um, and we only have about 17% that tell us that they have not implemented this type of strategy. And in our last item, we're looking at the restriction of 3% sodium chloride infusions. And uh, that is one of our higher scoring items. 75% of organizations were able to fully restrict the 3% sodium chloride infusions to the pharmacy and keep them in approved areas in very limited quantities. So we, we like to see that that is occurring and very much a best practice. Next slide, please. So you'll see that these recommendations are very similar, uh, very much in fact, to those that were put into place for concentrated potassium chloride. We're talking about limiting access to the pharmacy and avoiding um, only having special um, storage, uh, special circumstances where storage may be uh, allowed in the clinical areas, um, but then there's other strategies that are put forth along with it. We still believe that we should be limiting compounding to this electrolyte as much as possible, avoiding those custom preparations and um, using those automation and workflow systems when that compounding has to occur. If any formulations have to be set up, we'd like them to be set up ahead of drug shortages as much as possible, ahead of that emergent need. And sequestering the sodium chloride in storage to avoid misplacement in stock, again, avoiding those open matrix drawers, the ADCs and the towers, and requiring barcode scanning and smart infusion pump use um, so that we make sure that those dosing units um, are in alignment with the orders and the EHR. Next slide. In our last section, we're going to talk about concentrated phosphates, both potassium phosphate and sodium phosphate. Events with phosphate-containing products have been reported to ISMP for years and typically involve the lack of recognition of the associated potassium or sodium content. Um, this uh, issue that I'm showing you here goes way back to 1996, where we reported on a 71-year-old patient who came to the emergency department with AFib and hypophosphatemia. And at that time, one amp of phosphate was prescribed. Obviously, um, at this time, the patient, the hospital did not have a 24-hour service, so this involved a nursing supervisor who retrieved a single vial of potassium phosphate from the pharmacy. Um, the vial and storage bin cautioned that dilution was necessary, so the nurse diluted it in 15 mLs of normal saline and administered at a rate of one milliliter per minute. Um, fortunately, the patient suffered a cardiac arrest within four minutes, and uh, thankfully, the resuscitation was successful but the patient had received 8.8 .8 milliequivalents of potassium and six millimoles of phosphorus in four minutes. So had the entire syringe been administered, the patient would have received 45 millimoles of phosphorus and 66 milliequivalents of potassium from that uh, syringe alone. Next slide, please. Um, while we, we don't have the reports coming in anymore that people are just ordering a vial of phosphate, we do know that, you know, commonly these vials of phosphates, the sodium potassium phosphates are mixed up. And in fact, in 2013, we did a survey on parental nutrition and found that up to 28% of participants reported errors with the mix up with these two products. And in fact, it, it was um, so high, it was the top um, third, third highest um, amount of reported events we got back from that particular um, survey. And, you know, commonly, again, it's selecting potassium phosphate when sodium phosphate is needed or vice versa. We're forgetting to change protocols and the compounders and the templates or mixing up these products when loading them onto the compounder um, and we're overriding those barcode scanning, um, those warnings. Next slide, please. So of the items that we had in the self-assessment for the phosphates, only a third of participating organizations have an automated or manual process in place to actually calculate the concomitant amount of potassium that patients are receiving with each dose um, with, with the, pa the patient's passive, yeah, excuse me, considering the patient's potassium level at all sources of electrolytes when IV uh, phosphate potassium phosphate is prescribed. So slightly more, but less than 50% actually um, were using sodium phosphate to, retreat, to treat hypophosphatemia rather than potassium phosphate. And so we know that opportunities exist to improve these protocols and best practices 
And just to bring to awareness to the fact um, that we want to make sure that we are paying attention to the amount of uh, potassium in this product is if a potassium phosphate is being used. So next slide, please. So injectable phosphate recommendations include, again, the broken record of many of the same type of recommendations. But we really want to establish those replacement protocols, making sure that we consider the amount of inorganic phosphate and other clinical factors, age, renal function indication, avoid ordering by AMP, and making sure we have standard facility defined units of measure, millimoles versus milliequivalents every time we prescribe, label, dispense, administer, and document um, any of the doses of potassium phosphate so we know how much potassium is being received. Um, and also, again, a process to calculate the concomitant amount of potassium uh, to make sure that we are taking into account all other sources of electrolytes and potassium in the maintenance fluids, in the parental nutrition, and, and other products they may be receiving. It's important to differentiate these products as concentrated electrolytes in storage, uh, make sure that they're diluted, that they're administered slowly um, and minimally over six hours using smart infusion pumps with dose reduction software. Uh, so in summation, um, let's not take for granted that concentrated electrolytes adverse events have all resolved themselves. We don't hear about them so often, but uh, they, they can and they uh, still do happen. And please ask you to take the time to relook at this high alert drug classification and uh, evaluate your own current protocols and order sets and systems for safety. So continue this webinar, I'd like to turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Susan. Uh, so let's move now on to that last high alert medication we'll be discussing in today's program, magnesium sulfate injection. Uh, next slide, please, Jordan. Magnesium uh, is essential to all living cells, and many enzymes uh, do depend on magnesium for their functioning. There are multiple indications for the use of magnesium sulfate injection. It's used in the treatment of hypomagnesemia. It may be added to parenteral nutrition to correct or prevent hypomagnesemia that could arise during the course of therapy. And magnesium is indicated for the prevention of seizures in preeclampsia, which is a condition of persistent hypertension in pregnancy, and the control of seizures should eclampsia develop. The administration of magnesium sulfate prenatally um, also is a known intervention because there's demonstrated fetal neuroprotective effects when preterm birth may be expected before 32 weeks of gestation. IV magnesium sure has been repeatedly associated with medication errors nationally and internationally. And as with all high alert medications, errors with IV magnesium may result in serious patient harm or death. Uh, ISMP has published multiple articles concerning reports of errors involving mag sulfate in the past 25 years. Some of the earliest headlines uh, are included on this slide. These errors have involved a multitude of issues, mistakes in preprinted orders, lack of knowledge about proper dosing and administration, um, inappropriate uh, admixture uh, outside the pharmacy, um, the lack of standardized method for expressing doses of magnesium sulfate that has also presented organizational problems. Our next slide, please. Now, looking at the magnesium sulfate category of the ISMP medication safety self-assessment, there are 22 self-assessment items, and they've been grouped as eight general items, three items for the treatment of hypomagnesemia, and 11 items for preeclampsia, eclampsia, and fetal neuroprotection. 507 facilities uh, did complete the self-assessment magnesium category. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at some of the low scoring items for magnesium sulfate. The actual lowest scoring item, number eight here, was one in the general category. And this concerned the very fundamental establishment of a standard protocol for the administration of the rescue agent, uh, calcium uh, gluconate. Um, this would be in situations uh, caused uh, by magnesium overdose. Uh, these would be emergency situations and the prescriber would be notified. Um, this self-assessment item 
also included the provision that this rescue agent had to be readily accessible with those directions for use in any clinical area where high dose magnesium sulfate was to be administered. As you can see, only 27% of responding hospitals have fully implemented the safe practice, while 43% have not yet um, implemented the safe practice to this time. Um, the second item, this was in the hypomagnesemia category. Um, this concerned assessing the patient for signs of toxicity at defined intervals. Uh, again, here a low scoring item, 28% of responding hospitals had gotten to full implementation. Pretty impressive that 35% had not adopted, had not moved forward yet um, with this safe practice. And then in between, almost across the board here, 38% with partial implementation. Um, next slide, please. Now, these items on this slide all relate to the hypomagnesemia category. Item nine, only 40% of the respondents had fully implemented magnesium sulfate replacement protocols. These would be for the prevention and treatment of hypomagnesemia. 27% uh, had yet to take steps to create, uh, create these protocols while 34% had partially implemented them. Item 10 involves the use of standard order sets. Again, a, a pretty foundational safe practice for the treatment of hypomagnesemia, uh, fully implemented by 42% of respondents. Again, a significant uh, percent, 26% had not yet begun to implement order sets. And then in terms of detecting signs of toxicity, and determining the effectiveness of the treatment, 36% of hospitals had uh, fully implemented the safe practice. 45% were in the middle, um, had begun this work, and then 19% had still not uh, taken action on this item. Um, this work also was to include the monitoring of magnesium blood levels, serum creatinine, and clinical patient assessments, again, at established um, intervals for assessment. So let's go to the next slide, please. Low scoring items associated with preeclampsia. I wanna share two here. Um, the practice of immediately disconnecting the infusion bag when the magnesium is temporarily stopped. We're not talking about during a, a patient gown change, something um, of that nature, but when the infusion was to be paused, um, organizations were disconnecting it 54% of the time, while 26% had partial implementation. This one, you know, we know we have work to do on. And then uh, although still among the lower scoring items, you can see item 16, um, more progress has been made in the use of the 20 gram per 500 milliliter bags of magnesium sulfate for the treatment of preeclampsia. Um, we would like to see this infusion bags uh, concentration used instead of the 40 gram per liter bag. And this strategy will help to limit the amount of drug the patient could receive should an error occur. Uh, it also serves to differentiate magnesium sulfate from other infusions that may be in liter bags, such as lactated ringers, or on the next slide, um, in this case, potassium chloride. So in this event, an emergency department nurse received an order for a liter of 0.45% sodium chloride with 20 milliequivalents of potassium chloride. So the nurse went to the automated dispensing cabinet, retrieved the bag, administered the infusion. During the infusion, the patient's now beginning to seize and went into cardiac arrest. Uh, fortunately, the patient was successfully resuscitated, but while investigating the cause, what had occurred in this reaction, um, there was found to be an inc incorrect um, IV bag. So the nurse stated that he had taken out a liter bag of fluid with red letters on it from the ADC and, and hadn't realized it was actually a liter of magnesium sulfate 40 grams. So the pharmacy staff had recently added the 40 gram magnesium sulfate bags to the ADC in response to an ED staff request. So of course, in the uh, shuffling of the ADC stock in the cabinet to accommodate this request, things got moved around and the magnesium sulfate bags were actually in the same space that had previously held the 0.45% sodium chloride injection with the 20 of potassium chloride. 
Next slide, please. So the medication safety self-assessment data um, certainly did also reveal ongoing opportunities with the programming of magnesium sulfate infusions in perinatal settings, uh, particularly with the programming and the administration of the magnesium loading dose. And, and this is also very familiar to ISMP um, in, in our error reporting program and, and in our past work with the ISMP um, development of the smart pump guidelines. Um, this, self, this particular um, item from the self-assessment it is looking for the provision of loading doses um, to be administered by trained staff. Um, if you're gonna use the maintenance infusion bag to administer that loading dose, make sure it's on a smart pump uh, with a dose error reduction software and, and that feature, the loading dose or bolus dose feature, which is automatically gonna either start or resume the, the maintenance infusion at the prescribed rate um, once the loading dose is infused. The intent here also is that the loading doses as, as well as continuous infusions are never gonna be administered as a basic infusion outside the dose error reduction system. So although this item does have a mean score of 85% implementation, um, still we have some ways to go. 15% of respondents have either not uh, implemented or partially implemented it. And ISMP, as I mentioned, continues to receive error reports with the administration of magnesium sulfate infusions in perinatal settings. Uh, next slide, please. So for example, in this event, a 30-year-old female is presenting to triage and labor and delivery, 24 weeks pregnant, having complaints of cramping, abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, and upon exam, the patient was found to be in the early stages of labor. So, you know, certainly an urgent situation. Um, so an attempt to stop this labor, an intravenous infusion of magnesium was prescribed. The order was for six grams to be given as a bolus dose, and then followed that with the continuous infusion of two grams per hour. Unfortunately, when the nurse programmed the infusion pump for the, the loading dose, the bolus dose, um, the nurse did not program it through the drug library, which would have changed the infusion, um, that bolus dose rate of 12 grams per hour back to that order continuous infusion rate of two grams per hour once the loading dose had been administered. Um, instead, the nurse set the dose to run as continuous rate of 12 grams per hour, wanting to infuse six grams in a half an hour and intended to get back to that mother's room um, at that anticipated time. And of course, we know like that that did not happen. Um, and of course, then the patient begins to experience some evidence of magnesium toxicity, is having difficulty breathing, pressure drops, becomes unresponsive, code blues called, um, some CPR was performed, and then fortunately the mother became responsive. Um, the uh, calcium gluconate was given as an antidote um, because they were obviously suspecting magnesium toxicity and lab values did confirm a very high level at 12.8, therapeutic being six to eight. And then about two hours after the event, the baby was delivered by C-section and then taken to special care nursery for um, respiratory issues because of premature birth. Uh, so next slide, please. Now in this next event, a magnesium bolus was programmed to infuse via smart pump technology uh, the magnesium bolus was piggybacked into the main IV line and set um, to call back at the end of the bolus, which would be 30 minutes. So the bag was labeled with the magnesium concentration, the tubing and the pump were labeled. There was thought to be a good handoff at the shift report. Now the RN who took over the patient's care, this was an experienced labor and delivery nurse. This nurse though had just completed orientation at this organization. The nurse went back in and ended up reprogramming the bolus dose of four grams in 30 minutes. This happened a couple of times until the bag was almost empty um, before the nurse recognized um, what had been done. Um, this mag level had gotten up to eight. Um, and this type of event certainly points out the need to evaluate staff competency uh, with the use of smart pump technology in the programming, particularly of these loading doses from the continuous bag um, through that drug library. Next slide, please. Most errors um, in terms of intravenous uh, magnesium sulfate um, and obstetrics um, occur for a variety of reasons. Um, but let me just preface this that um, IV magnesium is routine practice in obstetrics. 
but the dosing regimens in labor and delivery are much higher than those used in other clinical areas, such as hypomagnesemia and cardiac arrhythmia. So despite many years of use for seizure or prophylaxis and fetal neuroprotection, again, in those situations where we're anticipating preterm birth, um, the administration of magnesium sulfate occasionally does result in accidental overdose and patient harm. And you can see here um, some of those reasons, unfamiliarity um, with the, the safe dosage ranges, you know, interpreting the signs of toxicity adequately, um, this can be flushing, muscle weakness, loss of patellar reflexes, uh, central nervous system depression. ISMP, again, receives error reports involving pump programming, and the literature indicates um, as well um, that administration errors, specifically wrong infusion rates, still represent a significant portion of magnesium errors, and of course, with real potential to cause harm. And then in addition, errors continue to occur when magnesium infusion bags or the tubing is mistaken for oxytocin or IV fluids. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, and we'll see an example that was actually just published um, not that long ago in ISMP's February 2020 acute care news, uh, newsletter. Uh, a mother was prescribed a bolus dose and a continuous infusion of oxytocin uh, to stem uh, postpartum bleeding. The nurse gathered what was thought to be an oxytocin infusion, but did not scan the bag's barcode prior to hanging the infusion. An hour after uh, beginning, uh, uh, after starting the infusion, the mom experienced hypotension, weakness, and vomiting, and was given IV Dancitron. And later, as they looked into this, they recognized that uh, upon uh, hanging the next oxytocin bag, what had been hanging previously and not recognized was magnesium 20 grams in 500 mils. So mom's magnesium toxicity was treated um, with improvements in symptoms. So let's move to the next slide. And here's a case where um, a mistaken uh, uh, opening of the magnesium that was piggybacked into um, the fluid bag was run wide open when there was an order to provide a fluid bolus. So um, the magnesium infusion that had to be discontinued, fortunately, um, this was discovered there was no adverse outcome to the patient. And let's go to the next slide. We, I sure want to mention a few high scoring items. Um, we've known um, over the years that a lack of standardized method for expressing doses of mag sulfate has presented significant risks um, in its management. Uh, in the official packaging labeling of magnesium sulfate, um, there's six designations, percent, milligram, gram, milliliter, milliequivalent, and milliosmoles. So on the right, you can see that there can be numerous methods for expressing a magnesium sulfate dose rate with the potential for mismatch between prescriber order and the units in the smart pump drug library. And because there are so many dosing expressions, it can be difficult to recognize excessive doses. But the good news from the self-assessment here is that we have high adoption of standard dosing units for both adults and pediatrics, as you can see on the right. And then we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, also, um, an important um, item that responding organizations also scored high on was the use of commercially available premixed bags of magnesium for all loading doses. Uh, so that would be the mean of 98%, and the mean for maintenance infusions was at 94%. Certainly a very high leverage safety strategy and eliminates the need for preparing magnesium sulfate on patient care units. And this also has implications for pharmacy practice as well to hopefully stem the need for pharmacy it, um, compounding of these solutions. So lastly, let's go on to the... Um, Final slides um, where we have some key strategies for the safe use of magnesium in terms of the development and use of separate protocols and order sets for each indication uh, for parental magnesium sulfate um, being uh, set up um, in terms of emergency preparedness with a standard protocol to guide the administration of the rescue agent and having it readily available. The use of those commercially available premixed bags and that standardized use of the 20 gram per 500 milliliter bag in prenatal settings or perinatal settings um, instead of the 40 gram per liter bags for preeclampsia. And then on the next slide, 
um, again, the importance of using that smart pump technology and then administration of that IV bolus dose with the, the bolus dose functionality um, is very key. And having practitioners understand um, how these pumps are set up to be programmed uh, to accurately. Um, these are also part of ISMP's targeted medication safety best practice number eight. And then on the last slide here, the importance of monitoring safety, cardiac uh, monitoring continuously, uh, the importance of knowing the signs of toxicity and their regular assessment at defined intervals. And then as we had touched on in the scoring of the um, items in this self-assessment, the importance of disconnecting the magnesium sulfate when it's discontinued or temporarily uh, stopped. And, and then additionally, when it's uh, discontinued to actually remove it from the IV pole and discard when the infusion is discontinued. And with that, uh, we hope that you will uh, be able to use this information to look at your processes um, and identify you know, perhaps opportunities for improvement, take a look at that self-assessment, and I will turn it back to Susan. Great, thank you, Michelle. And, and for Christina too, for that great insight into all of these uh, high alert medications and their applicable recommendations. Uh, just a reminder for participants who are looking for their CE credits, um, the attendance passcode for pharmacists and pharmacy technicians is listed here. It is 9RPW4C, again, 9RPW4C. And when you close out of this program, you'll go immediately to the website at ISMP, you'll be able to uh, choose the type of CE that you would uh, wanna select. Um, and I just also, I'm sorry that we are running out of time here for questions. Uh, we've been trying to answer some of them, certainly in the chat, but if, uh, if you have any other question you wanna get in touch, feel free to do so through the ISMP website. And uh, certainly again, I wanna thank Christine and Michelle for those great presentations. Uh, on high alert medications. Um, I'd also like to extend our sincere gratitude uh, to Baxter for sponsoring this program today. And lastly, uh, certainly but not least, uh, thank you to you, all of you, our participants for joining us today. And we hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>